we're going to start to to get into uh, how Baselands then extends upon um, what Badlands can do. So Badlands is great, um, but it, it does it doesn't give us any estimates of error or things like that. So so we can put in parameters that we think are right and test a whole bunch, um, but Baselands essentially lets us test thousands of scenarios um, and will give us a an estimate for how wrong or right we think we are. Uh, so, are there any questions at the moment? Everyone, everyone's comfortable so far? Badlands, easy, fantastic. So, let's move over to Rohit, who's gonna give us um, uh, an introduction to Bayesian inference and everything like that. Are you ready? Yeah, in five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah. They can they can play with Badlands. Okay, yeah. If you, if you just want to take like a, a two minute, five minute break or something, because um, this will be this will be a bit of a lecture um, that's taking place. So at at one thirty five, we'll, we'll start the. We'll start it. <laughs> of slides here. Um, they, they should be in the, um, the container as well. I think this is actually out there. Um, can I just ask, I installed the container on my other hide? Do I need to reinstall it? Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, shall I? Thank you, everyone. Um, shall I begin? Okay. Um, so um, my 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 presentation today is on base lens, and uh, uh, when I uh, when I made this uh, plan to this workshop, I sent an email around the base lens workshop, and there was some guys in social media. They were sharing, what the hell is base lens? You know, and one of these guys. He gave, gave me a snapshot of that. So I thought, uh, yeah, this is something, you know, this is something that can, can become very popular in the future. And I hope that it does. And this is basically, we are building up on, on Badlands. We are trying to provide uncertainty, quantification, and estimation of parameters. And I know uh, a number of people get overwhelmed when they hear about Bayesian inference, when they hear about optimization. And a number of people have been working mostly, mostly with, in modeling in uh, earth sciences, and they do not have the time to really think about optimization or inference because these models take so much of time. And this is why I see that there's a huge research potential in this area. And uh, I'm a C University of Sydney fellow, and I, when I came to know about these things, I thought, let me put my other work aside and just get onto this. So uh, I'm also based at the School of Geosciences here, apart from being affiliated from Edbyte Group and the Center of Translational Data Science. Uh, Nathan, how do we move this? And next, what do you say next? Um, it's a good question. Left and right. That should do it. Okay. So, um, moving on. Um, 
basically we know that uh, there are a number of free parameters or unknown parameters in uh, models and these models uh, range uh, all the way from uh, in areas in machine learning and artificial intelligence for example a neural network is a very simplistic uh, model oh, and uh, in, in earth science there are a number of models and what we have been used to are badlands uh, Pi Reef, for example, uh, and I have heard about Underworld and kind of know about what Underworld does. So that is, these are some of the uh, known models. And they all have an, uh, from a dozen, they could have a dozen to thousands of parameters. And uh, the, the problem in geoscience is that data is usually sparse, limit, limited, or incomplete. And uh, the, 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 the search for Parameters in these models, uh, we know you could use a number of optimization algorithms, but the major challenge is that a number of these models cannot use the standard optimization strategies that use gradient-based information because gradient information is difficult to obtain. And moreover, um, this uh, uh, evaluating a single model could be, could be very costly computationally. Hence, there is a scope for using non-gradient-based approaches, evolutionary algorithms, other optimization algorithms, and so on for, for optimization. However, there are challenges in optimization as well when the number of parameters increase drastically, and there are also limitations when we look at uncertainty quantification. So optimization is all concerned about getting the best or the near best solution, near optimal or near optimal solution. And it does not really cater for uncertainties naturally, but you would have to do a number of experiments using optimization algorithms to quantify uncertainty using a frequentist approach. So basically running experiments let's say 50 times and getting mean and standard deviation and then having some sort of confidence interval around it is known as a frequentist approach in statistics. So there are two schools of thought and then the others, that is one school of thought and the other school of thought is called the Bayesian perspective or Bayesian methods. Uh, and rather than having a one solution through optimization time, one point estimate, they say. Like, so you, rather than for that parameter, maybe a value of 2.2, for example, that represents rainfall, right? Maybe that is the optimal, maybe the optimal solution is 2.5, but you got value of 2.2, which is near 2.5. So you, rather than having that, what happens when you're using optimization algorithm, it all depends where you start from. And if you run 50 experiments, in each of them, there, some will get, give you 2.2, some will give you 2.3, some will give you 2.5, and 2.7, and so on. They will all end up at near optimal solutions. So the, the Bayesian approach is rather than having one point, you kind of have a distribution of solutions. So you have a range of solutions and basically you represent, use a probability distribution to represent the solution. So in this example where the rainfall of uh, uh, the values in the rainfall parameter is between 2.2 to 2.7, that is represented by a probability distribution. And we will move on and see how that is done. And therefore, it, people say that Bayesian inference is a principle or a rigorous form of uncertainty quantification. And just as in optimization uh, algorithm, there are a wide range of algorithms that use gradient-based approaches and so on, which are very popular uh, to kind of comp uh, to, to, to provide Bayesian inference or to implement Bayesian inference, you need to use MCMC methods. And MCMC stands for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And there's a wide range of algorithms in this, in MCMC methods. So one is the canonical MCMC random walk, sampler, whereas the other is parallel tempering and so on. And we are going to cover both of these. So, um, 
when we refer to, uh, you know, like uh, when we say sampler, basically keep in mind it is the sampler will provide you the near optimal solution that the optimization algorithm will also provide you. So uh, MCMC sampler is essentially a type of optimization algorithm or more, uh, more clearly an estimation algorithm that gives you the optimal, near optimal solution and it gives you the whole set of points around that solution as well. It provides you a distribution. And in, in the geoscience literature, MCMC methods have been used in a number of areas um, which, which look at uh, forward models in, in different domains, such as inferring the sea level, sediment supply, and uh, inferring ground, ground water contamination sources. So this is uh, uh, the, the very basics of uh, Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference is, uh, uses a likelihood that kind of tries to um, likelihood in, in uh, with a MCMC method. The likelihood uh, distribution is used to capture the the relationship between the model data and the, the parameters proposed. So um, here, as you can see, you have a likelihood, you have data, and you have some priors on the data. The priors on a uh, the priors, the, the, the priors essentially in the case of geoscience, for example, in badlands, the priors for a rainfall distribution would be uniform priors. That means that your, you know that your rainfall values will not be negative. So that's a prior. So a prior is essentially information that you try to put in, in, into your inference process right, if you give some info, initial information without looking at the data, right? So a prior is formed just by looking at the model and usually priors can also incorporate expert opinion. So Bayesian inference is basically a few, provides a fusion of information from experts, models, and so on to kind of, dev, uh, to update that prior belief into a posterior. A posterior, you could see it as what you attain after the sampling process. That means the distribution of your rainfall parameter. Whereas in optimization, you will give, get the value of the rainfall, which is, for example, 2.5. Through inference, you will get a distribution which the mean will be around 2.5, and that distribution is called the posterior, okay? So that's just the, the difference from prior to posterior. And basically the goal of Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo method is to kind of adjust this prior. As you can see, this is the distribution, it looks like that. And then use MCMC uh, and, and Bayes theorem and then you get a posterior distribution. See, the posterior distribution is slightly different from, or, or much different from the prior. So, Reverend Thomas Bayes is the guy behind Bayesian uh, inference, but uh, he, he was a philosopher, a theology, theologian as well, so he, not only did maths, but also wrote books about divine intervention and so on, you know, philosophical books back, back in the days. Very interesting guy. And there's the other guy, Laplace, who is not really that well known for Bayesian inference, but a lot of work was done by him as well. So we see that this is the, the, the infamous uh, equation, basically. It's, it's, shows you the likelihood, probability, evidence, and the posterior probability. Uh, we, we will go much in, into detail with this, actually here. You can see that, so this is the probability of being true given that B is true, the probability of being true given that A is true, the probability of A being true, and the probability of B being true. This is the posterior. 
this is the posterior, this is the prior. And we, we will go into more details here. For example, this is your prior beliefs, that's your posterior, and that's the evidence. The evidence is also known, known as the likelihood. So basically, your rainfall parameter, for example, for bedlands, you would have the, 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 prior, the prior is that, um, the, 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 so this, that's the prior, the black, and then uh, the posterior, yeah, blue is the prior, sorry, you can't see. And, and the black is the posterior, and the likelihood is here, actually. And with MCMC, you, I, basically you sample from the, they, they say that you sample from the posterior. When, these are just the terms that are used. When they say you use MCMC to sample from the posterior, it basically means that you have some prior knowledge, you have your model, and then you are going to find the posterior. To sample from the posterior means to kind of find the posterior. So uh, uh, the, the likelihood, I mean, in, in theoretically or in a nice way looks like this, right? But the real world, we, have, we are looking at geoscience problems that have irregular surfaces and so on. And this is just the likelihood that uh, surface that we obtain from, from badlands for a continental margin problem that was shown by Nathan uh, the, 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 from the South Island. So let's not confuse ourselves with this likelihood surface and the actual surface of the earth, you know, that we use in badlands. This is just a depiction of the surface uh, where we have two parameters, erodibility and rainfall, and we are just trying to see what will be the likelihood given the combination of those parameters. And you could see here that there are a number of peaks, right? And there, there, which could be said suboptimal peaks. And if you kind of make a slice of this, then th that is just the one dimensional portion of it. And this, is, this, this diagram is looking at a one dimensional view, whereas this is a two dimensional, we're looking at two parameters here. So to, I, I know some of you are from, from very different various fields and then it's hard to kind of visualize what a distribution is. And simply this diagram kind of shows you what a distribution is. Any series, basically, you get a histogram of any series, and that's the series here. You could see it as when it is a time series. And if you make a histogram, that's a distribution, right? So we basically want to see which parts are the most, which, which numbers are the most likely. So what, what this is actually is, uh, the, is just a visualization of the MCMC sampling process for just one parameter. And for that parameter, um, there you could see, you, you could imagine that the green point is probably the true value, whereas you are sampling around it and you, you get uh, your mean value, which is four, which is something close to the true value. So we will go into much details with MCMC sampling. Any, any question so far about distributions, visualizing distributions? Okay. So um, Nathan showed us Badlands uh, example. What is Badlands? It's just, Badlands is a, is a landscape evolution model that is used to simulate topography development in various times and scales. This is the definition by Tristan, he's not here now. But uh, this is written in all of his, his papers in the Python notebooks. So basically you want to see, given a, a topography, how will this uh, topography erode after thousands or millions of years? So for example, we have this, uh, 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 continental margin topo topography and we see how it erodes after 250,000 years and then um, 750,000 years and a million years. Actually, we, 
due to limitations in space, and also we are not showing the animation here, the bed lens uh, model can show you the entire animation uh, of how it, it actually erodes. And that's the beauty behind bed lens. But what bed lens naturally did not have is how to find or, or, or the, the, the values, uh, for example, let's say let's say the let's say that we want to find how the landscape in sydney was formed we have mountains hills and places right and we we have some information that 10 million years the landscape was something like this right and we will need to plug in the right values for the rainfall value, erodibility, and a number of other parameters, the right values, so that when Bedland starts, like let's say 10 million years ago with the initial topography, it kind of produces at the end of the 10 million year simulation, a topography that is equivalent to the modern day Sydney we have now. But to have that, it should, to do that, Bedland should receive the right values for rainfall, erodibility, and so on and so on. And the Bedland's model does not have that feature. So that is where we are, that is how we kind of got involved. And then we proposed that we could use either optimization or inference. And then we weighed, weighed things down. Then we, we finally, finally decided that we should have a inference approach to, the, to this because with inference we'll be able to provide uncertainty quantification and as you know that if you go look at data 10 million years back in time that data will be very sparse the initial conditions and and so on uh, for badlands so it is good that the model parameters have uncertainty quantification So basically that's Badlands. So how do we use Bayesian inference through MC uh, methodology with MCMC -MC sampler for Badlands? So this is just a depiction of the entire framework. Firstly, we, ha we, have, we have Badlands here and evaluating one model as, as when we ran just before this took seven seconds. It could take 30 minutes to one hour and there are cases we heard could be a few hours even to run one more, right? So that means, and usually for, for sampling, we usually need at least 5,000 or 10,000 samples. So even if it is one hour per model evaluation, 5,000 samples means 5,000 hours. And that could be, I don't know how many weeks to a month or something like that. And hence, uh, it is not it is not viable to use it. Therefore, we changed the project, uh, appended, uh, amended that this project, uh, and used something where we use high performance computing to do this. So let us first understand the basics here, because so with this we are just using a single core in the single core of the operating system or, or of the computer and. There is no parallel uh, process running in here. It's just a single code, and you could just, just, just see this as a very simple procedure where you propose, uh, let's say, a value for rainfall. You you randomly pick, you know, a, a value for rainfall and give it to Bedlands and let Bedlands run for a million years in time, and then at the end, Bedlands compares the what is the simulated view of modern day Sydney versus what is the actual uh, topography of modern day Sydney? And Bedlands compares that this base lens will compare the difference between them, the simulated versus the actual. And then with that difference, it will calculate a value in the likelihood. And the likelihood basically is based on the root mean, uh, on the squared error basically on the difference between the two topographies. That's what the likelihood does. It's just a probabilistic framework, probabilistic way of, of capturing the, uh, the difference in the simulated and the actual topography. 
So now you will ask me, why not consider all the simulated values for the 1 million years? The reason being, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, 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 so why not, why not, why not consider the difference between the simulated values of the, the past one million years? Because we do not have the, we do not know, you know. We just know the present day topography. If you knew that information, then that information could be incorporated into the methodology. However, in this, uh, this project, we did consider something else, and that is the sediment erosion and uh, deposition, which is the sediment. So once, uh, when, when there's a, the, uh, the rain, when it rains, those mountains kind of erode away and there's sediment deposition. And basically, in the real examples, you could have some data about the past millions of years of sediment information that would be like, um, you know, how many meters of sediment was in location A, B, C. So in some locations, you could have some sediment information for past five million years ago or seven million years ago in the 10 million year period. Let's say you have just for two time scales that can be captured by our base lens basically. So we not only look at, um, we not only look at uh, the simulation versus the actual of the topography, but we also look at simulation versus the actual of the sediment deposition. Okay. So basically the, 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 the basic algorithm is, this is a very simple algorithm and you will see the IPython notebook for this later. It is um, the main part of the algorithm is just a couple of lines. It's basically proposing something and then doing so you propose a value for rainfall, for example. Let's say we're just dealing with one parameter. So you started with a, and, and so what is your prior here? Your prior, let's say here is that you, your rainfall value will be between zero and five, right? So that is your prior information. So you have a uniform distribution. Basically you draw from a uniform distribution. Drawing from a uniform distribution actually means that generating a random number between zero and five, okay? And the distribution there, there are a number of distributions. There's uniform distribution and normal distribution and so on. We will show this to you later. So you draw from that uniform distribution. Uniform, distribu uniform means that the, the chance of you getting that number is, uh, uh, you know, it, it is flat. Basically, it's equally likely. Whereas uh, uh, normal distribution, the chance of you getting a number around the, around the mean is more likely than getting a number far away from the mean. So, so, so first you need to propose something, right? You need to propose somewhere and that's what your initial values is, right? And then you draw parameter vector X from priors. That, that's what it means. And X could be rainfall, erodibility, a marine coefficient, uh, M and N, I don't know what that means. Only Tristan knows what M and N means, <laughs> and and a, a number of other things, you know. And uh, and also, you could have your rainfall. You could have your rainfall parameter. Just one value of rainfall for entire Australia may not be the right parameter. You may need to divide Australia in a grid of like thousand points or something, so that instead of one parameter, you have thousands of values. But anyways, here we are looking at just one value, for example, and then you propose that, let's say you said uh, 1.9, and then it says that uh, you propose a small perturbation to that value, and then you approximate, so you kind of put the random, uh, add a random noise, and then you it's basically send this value to Badlands and Badlands returns, what Badlands returns is just a simulated topography, the end of the one, uh, one or 10 million years, that topography. And basically you would, in the, in the likelihood function, you would make a comparison of the difference between that, right? And that you calculate your likelihood, 
We will go into the maths of each part into detail. So no worries there. I just want you to know the bigger picture actually, okay? So we'll go into the maths of these, we'll go into the, the maths and even the, the, the code for these. That's all in our IPython notebook. And then, then you either accept or reject what you got. Accept means that, accept or reject basically means that, that 1.9, if the likelihood was good, right? Likelihood was good. A good likelihood means that the value of likelihood was lower, actually. Oh, I mean, going towards positive number. So that's a good likelihood, which means that the simulated topography is very much close to the actual one. The difference is smaller. So that's a good likelihood considered. Whereas if the difference is much, much there's bigger difference. Let's say, for example, in Sydney, there, were, there are 10 mountains. But in your simulated, in, the, in, in your, you know, you know, in your actual topography, the ground truth, you have 10 mountains, but your bed lens produce only two mountains, right? So when you compare the 10 and the two, you will have a, you know, a poor likelihood estimation. So the chances of that being rejected, when it says being rejected, that means that the proposal that came in, which was 1.9, that will not become the current value. It will, it will be kind of discarded. And if your current value was 1.5, that will remain as the current value. So you are going to do that and then repeat this, this, this step over and over again till the max samples has been reached like for 5,000, 10,000 or 100,000 of the time. So that was a visual representation of the process. This is a very algorithmic representation of proposed new values, and calculate the acceptance probability and accept or reject here. So, but the, it, you can see this part in here is basically based on Bayes' theorem. To accept or reject the proposal, you kind of need to understand Bayes' theorem. And more on the problem formulation, The, the, the observed data is, is known as this fancy D. I don't know how, what mathematicians call it, but I would just say fancy D now. And, and this is basically Bayes' theorem. The probability of theta conditioned on the fancy, fancy D, you get D conditioned on theta versus probability of theta over probability of, on the fancy D. And, and basically, go, going here, how, did, how was Bayes' Bayes law? So that is basically Bayes', Bayes theorem or Bayes' law here, right? Instead of, instead of A, we are calling it theta, and B here, we are, sorry, A, we are calling it, uh, yes, theta, and B, we are calling it the fancy D. But how was this derived? This is derived from, from this, the probability of A given B, the probability of A given B, with uh, given the multiplication rule, you, uh, a probability of A given B is probability of A, um, hmm? yeah, intersection B divided by probability of B. So the A intersection B is same as probability of I multiplied by probability of B over I, okay? So you see on top of your base theorem, you have probably this part basically. And, and this is how the base theorem, the conditional probability is de derived. So going, going into this bit here, going onto this bit here, basically, I, I don't know if you could view things there. Basically here it says theta proposal and below it says theta current, okay? So basically it's basically a relationship between theta, your proposal value for your rainfall and your current value of rainfall, right? And the relationship of them in relation to the likelihood. And how is that further derived? So this is what it is actually in that that algorithm, 
and using uh, the principles of Bayes' theorem. Basically, the, the top part is here, the top part, and the bottom part is here. And that same concept from the probabilities, the, basically this whole thing is on the top here and bottom there. But the only difference between them is that on the top you have the proposal and on the bottom it's the current. So the theta is on top is proposal and theta on the bottom is current, the C, okay? You can see the theta is proposal and the theta on the bottom is current, but the D, which is your fancy D, remains the same. And that is divided by the probability of the fancy D. Basically the fancy D, which is this uh, numerate, uh, denominator here, this thing, basically it cancels out. It cancels out and then you're left with this, right? And, and I know that you may be wondering, then where is, where is bed lens here in this, in this formulation? Where is bed lens here? Then we kind of adapt this formulation by putting a G of theta instead of just theta. And that is, that G theta refers to the bed lens model. No, it's the, the, the model itself, the governing equations, not, not the, the output of it. Yeah, the likelihood. It's from, yeah. Basically, the li this whole thing, this whole thing is the likelihood, basically. The likelihood considers your theta that you have proposed, and it gives that theta to your bed lens. Bed lens produces all that uh, millions of surfaces, and the end surface, the likelihood, again, compares it with the uh, ground truth data, and then gives a value, basically. So th this is basically the likelihood, okay? Right, so, so that, is, that is just a fine, the simple uh, approach of using a very simple MCMC random walk in, uh, in sampling. Note that the simple MCMC random walk does not use any gradient information. When we say gradient information, so you see here on the top of the algorithm, here yeah, I say propose new value, right? You could propose the new value by taking some gradient information. Gradient informations are things that kind of are defined by the model. Uh, maybe the model structure and so on. That is the, the gradient information that you get. So that the proposal that you give is in a better position. Going back to the gradient information, I know it doesn't sound good, but here, like, it, we, the, what gradient descent basically does, like if you, I mean, if you're traversing through this surface, the, the methodology that we have, we just end, add random noise to your current value, and then you basically move around this surface, right? And if you had gradient information, basically it gives you more details on where you should go next, right? So it's based on basically, you could imagine mountains and hills and you want to find the lowest peak or, you know, so the gradient information basically says that, that you are traversing down and it's, 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 it's better that you take larger steps in, in this side of the hill, then you will reach there faster, basically. But the thing is, gradient information is available for models such as neural networks, right? Where we easily understand what the model is. But for complicated geophysical models like Badlands, we don't get that information. Rini, can I just ask though, you were talking about um, having a random sampling, right? For example, rainfall, you say, okay, the minimum is zero. Do you set also a maximum? I assume so. Yes, so that's what the prior does. Okay. The prior is minimum and maximum. Okay. So let's say, let's say that you, you have info, you, you are, your, your prior at the moment is a uniform prior. That means there's a minimum and, and a maximum. But let's say that you had some more prior knowledge that 
you are you have more confidence that your main value will be around 2.5 you know so that means you could use some other distribution not a flat flat distribution you could use a normal distribution that gives more information or, or you more confidence that your you know your value will be around that area so so that was our first part of the project then what we did we moved on from that project to because we had a number of challenges we our the model that we were given by uh, the examples that we were given by Tristan we cheated on those examples basically we made a faster version of those things you know so you know things that taking one model uh, evaluating a model was like for the crater example was like three minutes in the beginning and we turned it down to one second. You know, so instead of, instead of evolving it for one million years, we went to, you know, 50,000 years. And then the resolution factor and so on to, to reduce things you now. And, and then we made that work with the MCMC baselines basically. But we knew that that is not going to work out when we are going to look at bigger problems. So we thought, let's move on from here. So we basically finished that paper, submitted that and kind of mo moved on from that and developed something called parallel tempering baselines. And basically parallel tempering, you could see parallel tempering as your MCMC uh, algorithm that is being executed on different cores on a high performance computing framework Actually, in your laptop, you have four cores there, and with hyperthreading, you are ex you are given usually eight cores. You know, so one core is usually divided. So you could imagine that instead of waiting for one MCMC sampler to end the task after one day, now you have eight cores. So you distribute your task across the eight cores. So instead of one day, you will. Theoretically, it is 24 divided by eight, the time. However, the parallel tempering is an approach where while it is sampling, it's not that those MCMC samplers are run in uh, isolation. Parallel tempering considers them to have some sort of communication between them. So, so that you could imagine it, it as that in here, going back to the surface, which is our favorite at CDDS, especially Sally likes it a lot. <laughs> and, and actually they are, Sally and Richard, they are at the Turing Institute uh, at Oxford. And, and they are, the team there, they really liked this surface because they are also a parallel tempering group there. And they now look at some real geoscience problems. Uh, and, and this one they, they got, really amused by it. So you could imagine that, let's say if it was just your MC, MC sampler, it was just started here, right? It's just traversing all this way and then basically in 5,000 samples, which was the maximum, it ended in there. And then you did not really get a good solution. You did not reach your 2.5 value of rain is here, let's say in here. You did not reach it, You're, you are still in value around two, let's say which is here, right? Actually here, the optimal value is 1.5. So you are, you, are, you are around 2.5 and you did not get a good solution. Whereas parallel tempering, you will start here, there, 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 and you'll start like in 20 or 30 different locations. And then you are going to, each of those samplers are going to co communicate with each other, which likelihood is better. And some of them will swap their solutions. And then you are trying to get somewhere around near. You see, so this is what parallel tempering is going to be useful for. And with that motivation, we developed parallel tempering. But typically, parallel tempering is, can be implemented, does not need to be implemented in the high performance computing framework. It can be com implemented, in a lot of people uh, have problems, just you can implement it just for one core, basically. So instead of having a parallel, you can have a sequential version. And you, you could do that, and we did, that's how we started. So, so essentially the communication prevents 
the different samplers kind of covering the same areas, wasting resources. Yeah, yeah, with some probability, basically. Are resources then reallocated to an area where the gradient is high? So basically, we are we are we are traversing the space without looking at gradients. It's just, but you could imagine that the random, the small noise, Gaussian noise that is added to the random wall, you could think of them as gradients of some sort, but. We are not controlling that process. We just leave it as it is. I guess maybe if you if you get stuck in local minima and maxima, also too strong. Okay, this is great. You know, so introductions, interactive Sorry. session like this. This is great. Now, now it got you time to think without me telling you. You know, so so yes, those issues are there. Local minima, you know, global minima, you know. All those issues, are, that's why parallel tempering is there. And the major component of parallel tempering is a, is a feature known as the temperature, the tempering. So parallel tempering is motivated by the principles in thermodynamics. You know? So if you search the literature, do a search on Google on parallel tempering, you will see a lot of journals in physics published about parallel tempering, chemical engineering journals, astronomy. So it is, a, it is something that's used across all the, the, the fields. So it is based on thermodynamics, which kind of says that uh, when you, you know, like uh, the forging process, where, when you go to people who kind of shape metals, you need to have, keep metals in a very high temperature to make maximum changes to the shape of metal, you know, those, those metal work guys. And when the, it, it's slowly cooling, and as it is cooling, then the more, then it won't be able to make much changes, you know, to the shape. You would have to really work hard. Whereas in the beginning, you just pound it a bit and then it changes the, the, the shape. So, which, which means that the analogy here is that at, at higher temperature, you accept more, more solutions that are not great, you know? So you kind of traverse, you have a global search, and then at lower temperature, you have a local search. I have another analogy for this, which I always tell my students. When, when you come to the university, I usually tell them, in the beginning, you kind of mix around with everybody, you know, you, you want to know people. So, and you hang out with people, although you don't like them, so that you want to know them, <laughs> you know? So in the beginning, the first semester, you kind of mix around with people. And then after the, the following semester to the year three, you end up kind of having a very small niche of friends. Why? Because in, in the beginning, you really explored and now you don't, you know, you cannot take it anymore. You just want to be with your, with your, the people you like. So, but you did, to find these people that you actually like, you really explored in the beginning. Otherwise you wouldn't have found them. So this is, uh, this is uh, the, the, the basic principle. So in the form of distribution, you could see, you could see this, uh, this surface here, you could see it as a likelihood. So this is a, the, the likelihood and what happens Basically, for each of those chains, the cores are known as a replica or uh, we call it chain or replica in each course, the MCNC sampler running. And for each of them, the likelihood is multiplied by one over T. One over T is the one over temperature. So what happens when you have a low temperature your likelihood surface kind of looks, let's say, like this. But when the temperature is higher, the likelihood surface kind of flattens more so that the, you could accept poor likelihood solutions, basically, more than when you will accept them at a high temperature. So you could see that you could get more trapped with the low temperature, but you can escape a local minima at a high temperature. Basically, your problem is saying, but the way that you, each of your replicas are kind of uh, representing the problem, that kind of changes. So that some of your replicas, so you could imagine that your temp, so there's something, the temperature ladder. 
So let's say that you, you know, each, you have 20 replicas and each replica has temperature one, two, three, four to 20. So those replicas that have temperature, let's say one, two, three, four, those guys will have less likelihood, it's less likely for them to accept poor solutions. They are more for uh, uh, local search, whereas thus with higher temperature, they, they are more likely to accept uh, poor solutions. But after some time, I mean, uh, actually in the canonical parallel tempering approach, so you, you make metropolis moves, basically. You make moves here, whether you accept or reject a solution. And going to the parallel tempering algorithm here, so you have algorithm one, which is the normal metropolis Hastings algorithm that I showed you, MCMC. Then you have algorithm two, that features algorithm one. So you have the parallel tempering algorithm, you have the same way things are drawn, but you have all the different replicas from size one to M, so let's say one to 20. And then for each of them, you call algorithm one, whether you accept or reject a solution, then you propose whether you want to swap between the replicas. So some of the solutions, between let's say replica one will be swept with the replica two in the canonical approach. And we are using the canonical parallel tempering approach for swapping. The replica, so the replica exchanges, the solutions are changed only with the neighboring re replica. But in the literature, there have been some implementations that the solutions are changed with other replicas as well. And they found that this works better when you have when you are restricted by number of cores, we have less CPUs or less replicas, then it is okay. But if you have more replicas, then it's better you just swap between neighboring replica. And thanks to BGH that we are given fair amount of CPU cores uh, to do these experiments with more replicas. So basically there's a similar approach is uh, used here in the acceptance probability for swapping between the replicas. Just similar style used for accepting solutions within a replica. So you either accept a solution or reject a solution or you swap the solution, okay? So these are just the two major steps and you could visualize it mentally. <laughs> so one, one major part is that, um, how is the distributions created? So when you accept a solution, so basically let's say you have 5,000, you have 5,000 samples, and now you, you're using 20 replicas. So that 5,000 will be divided by 20. What is 5,000 divided by 20? 250. So each of those, each of those replicas will just do 250 samples each. So we theoretically, you know, instead of 5,000 hours, we now have 250 hours of sampling. If one, if one uh, model took one hour evaluation, let's say it was an expensive problem. So what happens for each of those 250 samples, we will have a list of all the proposed values and the accepted values. We have that list, and that is basically this, this part of the algorithm is creating that list. If it is accepted, then you add it to the list. If it is rejected, then you just repeat the last part into the list. What was the last value that was accepted? So what happens when it is rejected, you are just going to repeat the previous parts, and that previous part was a better solution. That's why you rejected this guy here. And in that way, you are going to form a list of, uh, you have a list of uh, all your values for rainfall, erodibility, and so on. And then you make a histogram of that. That is basically your posterior after the sample. What happens, the mean of that posterior, we take it as one of the, we, we take the mean of that list basically, and then we find, that is, we, we think of it as 
something as a NIA optimal solution. Okay. So in a distribution, like in a normal distribution, the mean, that list you'll have that mean there. And that's your, and use that, plug it back into your uh, bed lens, and then you will get a surface that is very close to the surface that you had, okay? So uh, basically these are all this way, uh, you know? So I kind of made you imagine more before showing you this. So this is the different temperature letters and how the swaps are happening between them. And you could see this as 250 samples and this is going all the way to 20 temperature letters or 20 replicas. And in between the neighboring guy, uh, there's some swaps. But you see, this is not a canonical implementation. The swap is happening from temperature one to temperature seven, but not in our implementation. And then for each of those chains, as I said, the, the distribution. So this is after getting the histogram of that list of 250 samples, let's say for chain, chain or replica one, replica two, replica three. So you have so many distributions here. You will have as many distributions, as many, as many replicas. What you do, you just match them together. You add all the, concatenate all those chains, and then you'll get one final distribution. This is, by the way, a multi-model distribution. Okay, so now I, I, I will take 10 more minutes to sum things up. Uh, so we created synthetic ground truth topography. The way we did it, we, we had some initial uh, conditions. The initial surface, for example, crater, and then crater after 50,000 years here. And then we have continental margin after then 1 million years. This looks like this. So we take this as the ground truth. Why? Because this is all simulated things. We are not looking at the real problem at the moment. We are, even the, the, the New Zealand example, we are considering it as a simulated case. And the thing is, the, the New Zealand, that example is of this time, you know, for now. And we are evolving it after 1 million years from today. But after 1 million years, we don't have the ground truth. It hasn't happened. So we kind of evolve it, and then we take that ground truth as the actual. And from now, from today, we assign the values in the rainfall, erodibility, and all the six parameter values. So then it evolved to this. And what are those six parameter values? We are giving it in this table, for example, here. The, all of them had rainfall of 1.5 m slash a, and erodibility doesn't have something, uh, doesn't have the type of unit, it, no unit value, m value, n value, and then we have C marine and surface, but there's only for one problem, there's another value called uplift, and you could see that here, and thanks to Nathan that this problem became possible. Um, we had a lot of uh, bugs when we were doing this. So, this is a flat surface, and in this problem, there's another parameter called the uplift, which is you geoscience guys know much better than me. It is due to mental convection. There's uh, plate tectonics, and there's, due to that, we have uh, some form of uplift. So you could see that all of these guys have one value each, which is one rainfall value, which is, it, this, this is, very highly reduced when you compare to an actual problem because you have just one rainfall value and we are considering that rainfall value to be used for one million years but we all know that there's huge climate change you know issues you know so the climate has been changing every thousand years think or every few hundred years the rainfall value should be different but in, at the moment we consider it to be the same throughout the evolution and we also do the same for all of them the other thing is that we know that in different regions, rainfall may be different, but we here we assume it is the same for all throughout the grid. So, and the, as I defined, that the model likelihood it basically captures the difference between the simulated and the actual. And this is basically the maths behind it. And uh, basically, this uh, kind of beautiful slash ugly equations that you see, depending on your perspectives. <laughs> Uh, or it, it is basically implemented in the IPython notebook. Basically, it's very simple. 
you could see, because why do we have these two sums here? We sh you see the D and the F. F of the theta, this is what your bad lens produces. So you give it a theta, that means values of rainfall parameter and so on and so, and it outputs you a topography, that's the simulated topography, and you compare it with the D, which is the actual topography. Basically, it's a subtracting two um, surfaces, point by point subtraction. And, uh, and you, uh, tau squared is basically a parameter, which you could say it's a parameter that kind of considers noise in the model. And this whole thing is because uh, we are following the Gaussian distribution, and this is the maths behind the Gaussian. So this, is, this likelihood is actually called the Gaussian likelihood. And for sediments, because for the sediments, we need to also consider the time information. So in our case, we considered four different sediments at four different times. So we random, uh, arbitrarily picked some areas and basically we looked at the height of the sediment deposition in this area at four stages in time, basically. And we subtracted them, the actual versus the simulated one and we added this to the likelihood. So we have example where there is, uh, where we don't use any uh, sediment information, which is the mountain example, but in the others we are using sediment in time. So, uh, so now comes the design of the experiments, the first set of experiments that use MCMC random walk, and uh, this is just a visualization of the likelihood, and this was for for uh, the continental margin problem, and this is just for the crater problem that you saw, the, 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 the relationship between the rainfall and erodibility. What these things say is that there is a combination of rainfall and erodibility that gives you the high likelihood. So sometimes when you have less rainfall and more erodibility, that is equivalent to more rainfall and less erodibility, some combinations. That's why we see this peak there and a number of peaks. So, um, this is just what we got for the rainfall distribution. And this, this is basically all the, the trace plot of how it was sampled during the sampling process by MCMC. And you see uh, there's a number of lines in colors here because those are just different combinations of uh, rainfall and erodibility that gives a high likelihood because it's a multimodal problem. Yes, so yes, 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 exactly. Actually, so, so this is the trace plot. This is your, your basically, the, the width of this, the width of this is basically your range, the range of your search. And that's defined by your prior. That's the width. So it's a rainfall value. It starts from around one and it goes all the way to 2.5. Whereas this is just basically a histogram. So basically this says that around the value 1.5 was accepted the most, 20,000 times in 100,000 times of the, expert, uh, of the sample. That's one channel that you can say. So yeah, we'll go into the parallel tempering results next. So the parallel tempering project, were the goals were a bit different. The MCM, uh, the base lens MCMC was just to demonstrate how we can uh, wrap this up in a framework and, and have some sort of inference and look at the likelihood surface, whereas the parallel tempering was about taking those, that, that framework, using it in a high performance computing environment, lots of cores, see how the time is reduced and the accuracy is improved. So we invest, investigated on a number of things, which is how many cores should you use, how, what time should you run it for, and uh, what does it produce like. So this here shows that as you increase the number of cores, and this was for the continental margin problem, I think, the time in number of minutes from 700, it goes to less than 200 minutes after 40 cores. 
okay? And the accuracy is somewhat similar. We have an outlier here though. It's a bit difficult to explain this clearly, this accuracy part, because as you saw, the continental margin problem had a number of peaks, and it all depends, even by parallel tempering, we found that you could be not in that, the, the top peak is usually not found, you know, even by parallel tempering. But that photo that you saw, that, 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 that image that you saw of the surface, that was just for two dimensions, rainfall and erodibility, whereas we are looking at six dimensions, which cannot be visually shown. So it becomes a bit more complicated than that surface, like in a grand scale complication. So if you really want to know that surface, I would recommend you see Interstellar, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. that you actually miss yeah. uh, I, uh, uh, the chance of actually missing a global maximum is lower as you have more cores and more time but there's no you know quantified Is there a rule of thumb based on like number of number of parameters in a model? Roughly how many samples you have? There, there, there is no rule of thumb actually. Um, actually, uh, I mean, it's so almost. depends on the surface as well. Like, for example, in the on the continent, the margin we found that. The, the, the surface is so complicated, as you can see, our prediction RMSC, which kind of looks at the quality of the whole samples. Um, uh, when we have 1000 parameters, it's 120 here. And then 2000 is around 220, but then 8000 is also around 220. So it doesn't matter at times, even if you have taken more samples, because the surface is so complicated, even taking less samples, is almost similar to taking more samples at times. It also depends on where the chain starts. Because yeah. the chain can start at a very, like I said, as you can show the surface again. Yeah. Uh, the chain can start here. Start here. Can start yeah. at a local minimum already. So it's going to struggle to actually get out of it unless the temperature is different. So for the parallel damping, to go back again, uh, for the parallel damping, each chain has a different likelihood surface because the likelihood surface depends on the temperature. Temperature is high, it's going to see less of the small peaks and see more of the flatter surface, and the main peak being a little more obvious may be different than when it's at a lower temperature. So, this particular likelihood surface was at one temperature. So, it depends on which chain starts. Whereas, if the high temperature chain starts at the central point, so it'll be very highly likely that it'll be the maximum. Isn't it a very comprehensive fact? Well, that's because even at a higher temperature, the, the peak will become much more wider. Like it won't be just that center point, it will be like a wider round shape. And once you reach that point, then if that chain swaps to a lower temperature, then the peak starts becoming more obvious. Like that. So, for example, uh, in a higher temperature, the peak will be around the radius of that peak, sort of is like let's say 0.2, like it'll be from 1.4 to 1.6, like it'll be just going one peak in that. And while when that same chain goes to a lower temperature, it's going to see that the peak is actually at 1.5 and not between 1.4 and 6. Yeah. 
is there any benefits from doing the micro search sort of thing? Okay, I'll just quickly wrap this up in five minutes and then we can have discussion. Do you want to take some examples and come back? No, no, I, I, I just read this up because I'm too, too tired <laughs> to stand yeah. here. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's fine. I'll just finish it. I'll finish. Unless you guys want the break. So, so, so we can see that it's, it's a bit complicated situation here. We cannot have big generalizations about how many samples should be used, how many cores should be used, and so on. But, but in the grand scheme of things, you would like to use as many cores as possible, okay? Because you'll have, the model will take one hour or two hours, you better use more cores <laughs> if it's available. So uh, we have a quick summary of the results here. Uh, as you can see, the time taken, we're reporting, and all these things are in the paper. Uh, the, uh, the, so we have something, the sediment RMSE difference, elevation RMSE, and the prediction RMSE. Basically, prediction RMSE is uh, uh, combining sediment and uh, elevation RMSE. So basically, all those differences in the likelihood, the two likelihood, we, we join them together. Yes, Tristan? Uh, so by sediment sedimentation, the thickness of sediment Yes. So it is the sediment thickness, so it's a negative value than it is, it used to be considered as erosion, whereas it's a positive value, it's a deposition. So this is an example of one of those problems where we found uh, the, you know, like where it converged uh, for the continental margin problem. And basically this is what, what we saw. This surface here is very much close to the ground truth and it gives the, the view before that for the four <laughs> stages of evolution and this is an uh, this is just a depiction of the sediment deposition so this is erosion the bottom and this is the deposition and so you could see the the green is ground truth and the blue is the predicted and the pink lines are the uncertainties basically note how is the uncertainty quantified you could see that for if you are doing 10,000 samples, you'll have this 10,000 times this, this thing, 10,000 of those predictions. And basically we add them all up and get the mean and the, the, blue, the blue thing is the mean and then the credible interval or confidence interval slash credible in, interval in Bayesian inference. They call confidence interval credible interval. And that is the pink thing. So for all those accepted values, so each time there's, each, there's, there's, this is another data issue, you know, each time we accepted a solution, like a parameter, rainfall parameter, we also captured what is the sediment and what is the prediction in the topography. We captured that as well. So this is the same thing, uh, but for, for the mountain problem. And we give a cross section of the uh, continental margin problem. So this is just like a cross, like a Easter, Easter bun, you see a cross on top, that type of cross section. And, and, and you can see that there is the ground truth, the prediction and the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. So this is basically, we did not really we did not save all the images for the topography part because our hard disk was just getting full. It will be like more than 10 GB or it could be more, but we just gave, uh, saved the snapshot. So we wanted to show the uncertainties in the prediction. And this is basically the main purpose of Bayesian inference, that you have a natural way of accumu uh, accumulating, uh, accommodating uncertainty. And this is for the mountain problem. The, the, again, the Easter bun cross, and then you have uh, this, uh, you could see that the predictions are very much close to the actual ground truth, which means that we have found one of those suboptimal or optimal peaks in the rainfall or the erodibility. And this is an example. So you see here that we found that our inference 
process, uh, the optimal is 1.5. That is what we use to generate the data, the ground truth data. But what we found here is around two. So that is, a, we found a suboptimal peak, right? But if you see the, 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 the prediction, it is not so bad. So even those suboptimal peaks are not really that bad. It's because of the light having like similar values on a population. Yeah, but this is, is this one is, because this one is not for that problem. This is for the continental margin problem. So uh, the same thing in here for erodibility. And, but in one of them values like our sea marine deposition, we find the, the true value. So now comparing the two papers, the, the best thing here I should have shown a histogram. For the crater problem, we reduced our time from 136 minutes to eight minutes. And when we used 100,000 samples, we reduced our time from around 1,000 minutes to 78 minutes. This is like a major contribution. And uh, the, 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 the continental margin problems greatly reduced as well. 100 minutes to seven minutes and 700 minutes to 50 minutes. And the, the, the bigger contribution here we could see is that, that in our MCMC baselands, our sediment predictions were not really good. You could see an RMSE of eight, whereas in our parallel tempering, we see an RMSE <coughs> of 4.2. And uh, then you have a continental margin problem. You have an RMSE of around 400 something, whereas in our uh, parallel tempering baselands, we have around seven. You know? So there's a huge difference in prediction quality, not just time. So, uh, and, and the elevation uh, RMS is similarly drastically reduced so that our total prediction RMS from, for the continental margin became from 500 to 32. And uh, the time became from 100 to seven, which is a huge improvement in this actually. And again, that figure. So, Basically, we, the, all the aims and goals for the project, we fulfilled it. And this workshop is part of one of the other final goals for that pro this project. And we are moving on as well. We are developing baselines with surrogate assisted likelihood functions. We want to reduce this time further, actually. <laughs> There's more opportunities for improvement. So the way we are going to do it, we are going to use a machine learning model, like a neural network, for example, or a cogent process model that learns and tries to mimic the actual model. So sometimes you will not evaluate the actual model, which will take one hour, but you'll just evaluate a neural network, which will take less than a second or minute. So in that way, you are going to reduce that time. And, uh, and Konak here is, has showed that for neural networks, and we are looking at 1,000 parameters, and we are reducing the time by half in the neural network approach. And we are submitting this paper by the end of the month. And um, Daniel is implementing that for baselines. And that should be also, we're trying to finish this project by the end of the month or early August. And we will release it to our eighth byte friends. And uh, this is what, uh, what Sally is more interested in. She's interested in developing uh, better, better methods, and that's uh, this is one of the goals of our trip to Turing Institute. So, also looking at if there's some way in which your your proposal distributions, the way that you propose, instead of having a random walk, you have some graded information or some other other smart ways to to give that information. The other thing is that what um, we, apart from the uh, once we have done with the surrogate likelihood, we would like to apply it to a real world problem. And we were having discussions with Dietma and Dietma referred us to Sabine. We will have discussions with Sabine later of some real world problems. And uh, then uh, also we are looking at, uh, at time dependent uplift and time dependent rainfall. And Nathan is uh, taking care of that implementation with, uh, with Tristan there. And uh, probably by mid to end of August, we should be done with that. And basically, so and basically after September, I won't be doing that much of baselands. 
maybe small applications. And so this one major part here is that our time dependent uplift and our time dependent, for example, rainfall, let's say if we get time dependent and, and region dependent rainfall information for, for Sydney, we would basically have a time series and that kind of helps us understand not just the topographic development over time, but it makes us understand the climate patterns. And that's rich data that we're looking at. And we would like to show and demonstrate this for a real actual, for actual problem so that we, with that data, we can predict the future of climate. And, and, and the last, uh, but not the least, uh, parallel tempering can be improved with optimization methods, gradient information, in forward models, and so on. And we are giving it with this workshop and with the papers, we are giving the software packages, the libraries, and in the future, we would like to have a bigger library, you know, that with all these papers that are coming about in the couple of months, we would like to have our own library that, 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 that is released and used throughout Australia, hopefully. And um, thanks to our project members. And... Uh, and uh, everybody here, thank you.